Uh, next up, we have uh, uh, one of my partners at MUSC in interventional radiology, Dr. Brett Anderson, and he's going to talk. And we, how long have you been with us now? About four years, four or five years. Seemed hey, it's hard for us to know because he trained with us and then he went away and then he came back. And so he's been with us it seems like forever, but only four years as my partner. He's going to talk about transjugular liver biopsy, uh, one of our most common procedures in interventional radiology. Uh, thanks to David and his group. I think what Chris was trying to say is it seems like it's been a long time he's been having to work with me. Thanks for the opportunity, Chris. Thanks for letting me be a part of this session. And thanks to John Fairtech uh, uh, for all the work he does uh, towards this meeting. Uh, Dave did a great job um, setting this up. And uh, as he spends uh, the majority of his time trying to take care of the liver, I spend a fair amount of my time assaulting the liver of these patients. Um, so we're going to talk about transjugular liver biopsy real quick. Thanks for being here. Welcome to uh, <clears throat> warm and sunny South Carolina. Um, at least we have the sunny. Uh, we could have gone to Alaska and been warmer today, but they're stuck with the rain, so we'll, we'll, we'll take Kiowa. Um, what we're going to talk about today quickly is uh, goals of the procedure, why, you know, why we do a transjugular liver biopsy, indications and contraindications, uh, why we do this over a percutaneous or conventional biopsy, uh, either blind, ultrasound guided, or CT guided. The risk and possible complications, uh, how we do it, the technique, and some of the findings that we've uh, discovered. The goal is to safely obtain tissue from the hepatic parenchyma, the meat of the liver, uh, for the diagnosis of systemic diseases that affect the liver at the hepatocellular level. Usually we're looking for changes of fibrosis, cirrhosis. Uh, part of the procedure is also we will obtain an estimated value of uh, the degree of portal hypertension, uh, visualize the hepatic veins uh, as we need to, and also in most cases visualize the portal vein for its patency as well. Indications, uh, non-focal, uh, hepatocellular disease, uh, cirrhosis commonly. We also look for uh, rejection in transplant patients. Uh, the evaluation of portal hypertension uh, via wedged hepatic uh, pressure, via we uh, occlusion balloon catheter. Uh, we do look for portal patency. Um, uh, other indications is uh, someone with ascites where we're a little more concerned about a percutaneous biopsy or displacement of liver from the more massive ascites and also in the co coagulopathic patient, which is not uncommon uh, in this patient population. Um, if you're looking to hit a focal target, this is not the way to do it. We need to be able to see that, so we do that with other imaging modalities and percutaneous approach most commonly. Severely coagulopathic that we can't correct is, uh, is a relative contraindication, but not an absolute. Uh, and if the ascites is so severe causing the liver to dis be displaced in an unusual anatomic position, we usually overcome that by uh, large volume paracentesis and then proceeding with the procedure. And if you can't get there, if you can't get there from here, if there are any hepatic veins to work from, it's hard to do a biopsy from, from a hepatic vein. Some reasons that it's uh, better than a percutaneous approach, we get more information. Uh, we get do pressure manometry and get the pressure measurements uh, as discussed. We also get a right atrial pressure, not just the uh, pressures in the liver. And uh, decreased risk of bleeding, a uh, better approach than going percutaneously through the liver capsule and the pe people that are coagulopathic. Uh, some of the risks, uh, bleeding and infection, um, both are uh, very uncommon. Uh, given that we use ultrasound guided access to access the jugular vein, we've significantly decreased uh, problems with the access. Uh, you can stir up some arrhythmia across on the right side of the heart. Uh, if you're meticulous, this usually isn't uh, any sort of a problem. Uh, you can cause some bleeding. We are uh, stabbing people in the liver, as we say. Um, and uh, you can create abnormal communications between vessels in the bile ducts. Uh, you can get outside the liver and bleed into the belly. Uh, you can also bleed from the liver under the capsule of the liver and cause problems. Or you can end up somewhere you don't want to be uh, in the kidney. You don't want to do a liver biopsy and have the pathologist tell you you have normal renal parenchyma or cause any other problems as well. Uh, we look. We always look at old studies. We're, we're radiologists, so review the old films. 
We use ultrasound to access the jugular vein. It's a nine French sheath. Uh, big, but not too big um, compared to some other things we do. Uh, we typically get into the right hepatic vein is where we want to biopsy from. We use a multipurpose catheter, angle tip catheter to get there. Do a venogram from that location. Uh, we use an occlusion balloon uh, to get a free hepatic pressure measurement and uh, a wedge hepatic pressure measurement. And also with the balloon inflated, get an indirect portogram with CO2. Um, we have a rigid cannula to guide the biopsy needle. We typically use an 18 gauge or 19 gauge uh, true cut uh, needle. And um, we measure a right atrium pressure on the way out typically. And that's about it. This is what it looks like. The setup, it's a lot of stuff. The first time you know, a resident or fellow comes in and does a transjugular uh, liver biopsy, it's probably pretty confusing and uh, wonder what in the world's going on with this you know, 60 centimeter harpoon on the table that you're gonna put in somebody's liver from their neck. We obtain access in the IJ with ultrasound, local anesthesia, and we typically do this with moderate sedation. single walk access in the internal jugular vein, get a wire down across the heart, the sheath in place, and then we access uh, the hepatic vein with a uh, multipurpose catheter. Uh, we like to go from the right hepatic vein, it's a good place to work from, given the anatomy and the angle and giving you plenty of liver to biopsy. Once we get the venogram, we then exchange over wire for an occlusion balloon and obtained a free hepatic pressure uh, and typically the mid portion, the intrahepatic portion of the right hepatic vein, and then with the balloon inflated, obtain a wedged hepatic pressure. And we record those tracings and make sure that we're getting good numbers. Once we have the pressure manometry obtained with CO2, we obtained a wedged uh, hepatic CO2 portogram. And that's what uh, this looks like in this uh, transplant patient. And here's, uh, here's uh, one that's very nice and uh, kind of see the full extent of the portal, grain, portal veins centrally, reflux into the SMV and the splenic vein as well as the peripheral portal branches as well. Once we have that, we exchange for the stiff cannula, run that down over the wire, park that harpoon in the liver. And if we're working from the right hepatic vein, we rotate anteriorly in, into the right lobe. And usually we have obtained, and that's, there's an image of the biopsy needle with the uh, trough thrown, and we typically obtain two to three cores. Results, it works. We're successful 98% plus uh, percent of the time in obtaining adequate liver tissue for evaluation down in the lab. Uh, complication rate is very low, two to six percent. Major complication is uh, much less than one percent. Um, again, some of the complications that you can see. When we're done, we typically sit them up, or at least semi-recumbent, take the pressure off the IJ, uh, keep them in bed for a couple hours at least, watch them closely, make sure they're not having any problems. Pretty straightforward. Uh, some things that where we run into trouble, uh, can't get there through the right internal jugular vein, it certainly can be done from the left if you work carefully. Um, if you have to work from below, from the femoral, you can obtain the other parts of the study and potentially do a percutaneous biopsy to get the tissue you need. Um, uh, little, little techniques, little pearls, using breath holes, deep inspiration can get you there. Um, if you're having trouble getting in the veins, always use your other imaging. Uh, and, and then again, we can use other little, little technical tricks that we use to get where we need to be. Sometimes in the transplant patients, the, the liver's not always uh, where it was to begin with. Doing the CO2 portogram, we load up to 60 cc syringes typically. Uh, you bleed a little bit off because you don't want to slam the fluid in the catheter out before you bleed it out. Um, because you push pretty hard to get the gas out there and, uh, um, and we obtain DSA images during a breath hold and uh, get a portal venogram. 
The pressure manometry is a big part of why we do this, to assess this. So we get a free hepatic wedge, hepatic as I said, and do the calculation to get a corrected sinusoidal pressure or that hepatic uh, venous pressure gradient. And we also check the right atrial pressure as well. Uh, have to be careful with the position of your catheter to make sure you're getting uh, accurate numbers and not uh, getting spurious numbers in your measurements. So Dave talked about some of these numbers, uh, the wedged uh, hepatic vein uh, gradient, uh, less than six is normal, greater than six uh, would qualify as portal hypertension, and greater than 12 is when we see that increased risk of variceal um, bleeding. Um, the free hepatic to right atrial gradient, uh, we sometimes see a little bit of a gradient just between the intra-abdominal compartment and the intra-thoracic compartment. But if you see a significant gradient at all, you have to think about venous stenosis or a problem at the hepatic vein IVC or IVC right atrial junction. Um, so during the uh, CO2 hepatic portogram, uh, We've grouped these into how much of the portal vein do we see? Do we not see it at all? Do we just see the central portion, or do we see it all the way out into the hepatic parenchyma? So here's one where the injection just shunts back through some other hepatic venous collaterals, and we don't see the portal vein at all. Um, here's one where we see the main portal vein or central portal vein well. And here's, here's that nice picture, again, of kind of full visualization of the entire um, portal vein and its branches. So it might feel like I'm skipping around, but I'm going to tie these back together in a second. So uh, in chronic hepatitis, uh, the simple uh, staging classification, um, that's Ludwig uh, 0 to 4 from no fibrosis up to cirrhosis. Are there, are there any pathologists here? I'm not going to try to fool anybody that, uh, about these slides. But here's a stage 0 uh, sample with no fibrosis. Stage one is portal fibrosis. Stage two is periportal. Stage three, septal fibrosis. And then stage four is, uh, by definition, cirrhosis. So uh, looking at 102 uh, transgender liver biopsy patients, uh, 58 male, 44 female, there's the age range. Uh, 102 underwent a wedge CO2 venogram. Uh, 101 of those patients, we measured the pressures. Uh, and 83 were staged for fibrosis in the setting of chronic hepatitis. So when we do this, uh, this, this is what we found. That is, as you can see, uh, the association between the pressures and visualization of the portal vein, certainly as the pressures increased, a significant number uh, increased the visualization of the portal vein. The association between the pressures and the stage of fibrosis at the pathologic grading. And again, you will see that the, there's a significant increase as uh, you move down and to the right, uh, increasing the stage of fibrosis as well as increasing the pressure measurements. So now associating the portal visualization with the fibrosis staging, you see that association again that uh, for the stage fours, the full visualization of the portal vein significantly increases now up to the, to the top and to the right. And, uh, and this is the association in the chronic hepatitis patients, the fibrosis stage and portal visualization again. Uh, you see the, uh, the portal vein in the stage fours significantly more. What are the limitations of the transjugular liver biopsy? This is a hand-injected CO2 portogram, so it's not, uh, it's not necessarily the same case to case. Um, a few, uh, a small n, few number of cases in the lower stages of fibrosis, and uh, we didn't differentiate or, or select out by the uh, cause of the chronic hepatitis. In conclusion, uh, a safe alternative to a conventional biopsy in patients with non-focal liver disease. Uh, it gives us the other information, including the portal systemic gradient, which is associated with the de degree of fibrosis in the setting of chronic hepatitis. Uh, portal visualization is associated with the degree of fibrosis. And the filling of the portal system 
uh, on the carbon dioxide venogram increases with worsening fibrosis, making portal vein visualization more likely in patients requiring a TIPS. Thanks very much.